Northern Spain, one million years ago. Shouts echo atop a hill. Two groups, stone and spear in hand, struggle over the high ground. The attacking group, primarily made of young males, has been starving in the cold regions upriver. The hill sits above prime hunting lands. It is the only way to truly dominate the area. The encounter will be directly fatal to some, but failure to secure the location will mean starvation for the entire tribe. The older, more numerous defenders brutally pummel the inexperienced attackers. They themselves took the hill long ago, and have secured their dominance by preying on young individuals from neighboring groups. As moments and life slip by, the attackers fail to take any ground. The surviving few retreat as the defenders taunt their adversaries in gruesome fashion. The overseers have successfully protected their territory, and have gotten plenty of free meat in the process. A great day for a select few in the primeval past. Homo antecessor was a pioneering species at a time when most hominins were restricted to areas where the sun shined bright. They inhabited the frigid lands of the north not with technology such as fire, but with just pure grit. The remains they left behind tell a dark tale of struggle and conflict. Their world was one of flesh and stone, of tooth and claw. Though we may never be able to relate to them, they put our own beliefs in perspective and expand the possibilities of what it means to be human, inherently including them in the greatest story ever told. Now, it is time to talk about everything we know about the mysterious remains we call Homo antecessor. The Atapuerca Mountains of northern Spain have long been known for their abundant fossil remains. In 1966, archaeologist Francisco Jorda Cerda was the first to recover evidence of a primeval presence of early man. Initially, he was only able to find a few basic stone tools and some animal remains. Later in 1976, paleoanthropologist Trinidad Torres began excavation at the Grandolina site for bear fossils. He did indeed find many bear fossils, but also some very archaic human fossils. An extensive excavation of the area was made, and finally in 1992, significant human fossils were found. Formally described as a new species in 1997, these remains were named Homo antecessor, meaning pioneer man in Latin. This name was chosen because antecessor was thought to be the first human to colonize Europe and perhaps one of our direct ancestors. Subsequent years of analysis of the recovered remains, as well as new discoveries, have left us with many questions regarding this species and its relation to others in our genus. In the original description of these specimens, it was noted that Antecessor had an unexpectedly similar face to that of Homo sapiens. Its face was much flatter than expected for a hominin of this age, and the curvature of its cheekbones were seemingly modern. The original paper hypothesized antecessor may represent the last common ancestor between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. This assertion was mainly based on facial anatomy, an aspect of antecessor which has played a key role in our understanding of it. In 2007, primatologist Esteban Sarmiento and colleagues proposed that antecessor may not be a distinct species, but rather a distinct variety of Homo heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis remains are known throughout Europe starting around 700,000 years ago, which is quite close in time to Homo antecessor, which appeared around 1.4 million years ago, but disappeared from the fossil record about 770,000 years ago. It appeared that antecessor could even be ancestral to European heidelbergensis, considering that they were fairly similar and were certainly the first in Western Europe. Though two subsequent studies, one in 2009 and one in 2012, convincingly determined that Antecessor was not ancestral to Heidelbergensis and belonged to an early offshoot from Africa. Paleoanthropologist Richard Klein stated that Antecessor was an offshoot of Homo ergaster that disappeared after a failed attempt to colonize southern Europe. One of the biggest problems with understanding the facial morphology of this species was due to the fact that most of our cranial remains belonged to juveniles. The apparent flatness and other seemingly modern features may have disappeared with maturity as they do even with chimp or gorilla infants. In 2013, Sarah Friedlein and colleagues suggested that the seemingly modern flat face seen in Antecessor did not disappear with maturity. They also found evidence that flat faces have independently developed several times in our genus. A 2017 study found that Antecessor was likely not a modern human ancestor and split before the Homo sapien and Neanderthal split. In an amazing 2020 study, 
Researchers were able to sequence ancient proteins from the enamel of an 800,000-year-old Homo intercessor tooth. They compared the data with proteins from modern human and other archaic species. The data proved that Homo antecessor was far too different to belong to the same branch as modern humans, Neanderthals, or Denisovans. This proved the idea that Homo antecessor represents an early offshoot from Africa that did not contribute to future hominin species. This study was also quite significant because it displayed how studying ancient proteins can allow us to look deep within the Paleolithic. DNA itself degrades quickly and becomes unreadable in a few hundred thousand years. The oldest DNA sequence is 430,000 years old, while the oldest proteins ever sequenced come from a 1.9 million year old ape from China. Though sequencing ancient proteins is not nearly as accurate as DNA and often requires accompanying evidence to reach certain conclusions. To conclude, Antecessor is not one of our ancestors, and are rather an early offshoot from Homo erectus or Orgaster. They may have spread into Iberia from North Africa by crossing the Strait of Gibraltar. In the modern day, this would only be an 8 mile or 13 kilometer swim. This distance has of course varied throughout ice ages and geological activity. It is plausible that this is how Antecessor found itself in Europe seemingly before all other hominins. The oldest remains of Antecessor was a jawbone dated to 1.22 million years ago, but part of the upper jaw of another individual has dated to 1.4 million years ago. This is by far the earliest remains of hominins in Europe. The only other hominins that would come close would be the 1.8 million year old Dimonisi hominins from Georgia. Though this is not really Europe by most standards, it is quite far north for the time with a similar environment. So far, Homo antecessor has only been discovered in Iberia, specifically northern Spain, but it may have been much more widespread. A 2001 paper postulated that Homo ergaster remains from Algeria may represent the same population, though a later 2007 paper found that these remains were more similar to other African populations. Still, this paper supports the possibility that Antecessor had roots in North Africa. The stone tool assemblages found at Antecessor sites are fairly similar to some contemporary sites found in Europe. It is possible that Antecessor was the creator of these tools as well, though remains would have to be found to support this. Hominin footprints dating to 1.2 million to 800,000 years ago in England could be attributed to Antecessor considering they are the only known hominins in Europe at this time. Though this evidence is only circumstantial, it may prove that Homo Antecessor was much more widespread than we currently have evidence for. Now that we have a better understanding of where this hominin belongs in the story of our genus, we should talk about what remains we actually uncovered. We have uncovered about 80 fragmentary fossils and at least 6 different individuals. The most significant skeletal evidence recovered was from the type specimen ATD6-69. The remains consist of partial skeletal evidence of what appears to be a 10 to 11 year old child. Its face is completely flat unlike most Middle Pleistocene humans and quite similar to modern humans and East Asian Middle Pleistocene humans. Its cheekbones are also strikingly modern and unlike European Heidelbergensis. As mentioned earlier, cranial structure can change a lot with maturity. It was determined in 2013 that the characteristics seen in this specimen would still be present in an adult individual. What is so interesting about Homo antecessor's skull is that it suggests that the modern human face shape has evolved and disappeared more than once in our genus. Graphs showing simplified linear evolution of humans getting smaller jaws and flatter faces are not necessarily accurate. Evolution is of course not linear and this is exactly what we would expect to find in the fossil record. Seemingly modern looking facial features on hominins that are anything but. The reason Antecessor had a flat face likely has to do with its diet and therefore likely its environment. Other features of their skull were quite archaic such as their parietal bones which are flattened with a tent-like profile as we see in Homo erectus specimens. They also had very prominent brow ridges. Their lower mandible was quite gracile and they have unusual dentition. Their upper incisors are shovel shaped, an expected trait of Eurasian hominins, and their upper molars have more modern traits typically seen in Neanderthals. Conversely, their lower molars and premolars are quite archaic. They also do not have a retromolar space, a large gap behind the last molar. Unfortunately, we do not have this gap either and our modern diets have caused us to often need surgery to prevent our wisdom teeth from messing up the rest of our teeth. Homo antecessor would have not needed such a surgery just as pre-agricultural humans did not. 
Overall, their dentition displays a strange suite of derived and archaic traits, but nothing too unexpected. Moving up to their brain, we have a good amount to wonder. The remains of ATD 6-15, not to be confused with ATD 6-69, does preserve part of the cranium. Though this individual was also quite young, likely around 11 years old. Still, it had an estimated brain volume of about 1,000 cubic centimeters. This is fairly large considering that modern humans average 1,270 cubic centimeters for males and 1,130 cubic centimeters for females. Adult intercessor individuals may very well have had about the same size brains as we do, though of course the size of the brain does not necessarily determine intelligence. Our limited remains do not tell us much about the organization of their brains. Antecessors certainly had a large brain for the time, though subsequent hominins like Homo heidelbergensis had similar sized brains and so did even some Homo erectus. A 2010 study looked closely at the mandible of a 5-6 to six year old Homo antecessor. It found that the molars barely had any wear on them, which suggests that they erupted shortly before the individual died. This tells us that they had a developmental rate similar to our own, suggesting that they had a prolonged childhood. Childhood is when a significant part of our cognitive development takes place. Homo intercessor may have been more cognitively advanced than we give them credit for. Hopefully more cranial remains are discovered of this species, but for now we are left with many questions. Postcranial remains are also limited, but they do tell us quite a bit. An adult clavicle of one specimen tells us that it stood 162 to 187 centimeters tall or 5 foot 4 to 6 foot 2 inches. Yeah, quite a wide range, but this is the evidence we have to work with. Another adult radius belonged to a male estimated to be around 172 centimeters or 5 foot 8 inches tall. A metatarsal bone of an adult male also stood about this same height. This is fairly tall for the time period. Early European modern humans were slightly taller while male Neanderthals were around 3 inches or almost 8 centimeters shorter on average. They may have been slightly taller than Neanderthals, but one of the clavicle bones recovered is similar in form to a Neanderthal, suggesting a broad chest. A fossil shoulder blade tells us that they would have not been good climbers, but were capable of efficiently launching projectiles such as stones or spears. A fossil radius tells us that they had relatively long limbs for a hominin living this far north. This is unlike Neanderthals which developed short limbs to retain heat in their often cold environments. Their femurs and kneecaps were generally similar to modern humans and other middle Pleistocene hominins. The phalanges and metatarsals of the foot are similar to modern humans, so they seem to be adapted to carry a more robust body. They would have a slightly different gait than us, but it wouldn't be very noticeable. Overall, Homo antecessor displays a mosaic of characteristics that are entirely separate from any other known hominin. Its unique morphology and deep antiquity on the European continent supports its classification as a distinct species. Homo antecessor remains are associated with fairly simple stone tools. Cores were prepared and flaked, which produced crude bifaces. Their technology bears some resemblance to the Acheulean industry, but would more aptly be classified as Oldowan-style tools. Proper Acheulean tools were developed in Africa around 1.8 million years ago, but they did not spread to Eurasia until about 1 million years ago. Homo antecessors' tools were not of this complexity and relatively primitive for the time. Use wear on the tools from Grandolina show repeated abrasion against flesh. They are likely being used as butchering tools. The Atapuerca Hill naturally has a wide array of mineral outcroppings including sandstone, limestone, but also quartz and chert. These materials could all be used to make a sharp edge. Sharp flakes, cores, and hammers appear in their assemblages. There is no evidence that Homo antecessor utilized fire in any way. Their teeth indicate that they frequently consumed tough gritty foods such as raw meat and tough plant material. Natural fires may have been harvested from time to time, but we do not have any evidence if this is the case. Clothing, the other way to keep warm, also was likely limited or completely absent. Evidence of clothing is rare in general, but this is especially the case when talking about over a million years ago. Simple hides may have draped over the body, but for the most part, they would have toughed it out. It is thought that during colder periods, they would have completely abandoned central Iberia for the more temperate shores of the Mediterranean. Throughout the year, they may have moved along the Ebro River. Alongside Homo antecessor at the Grandolina site, 16 animal species have been recovered. These animals include various species of deer, bison, horse, fox, bear, wolf, hyena, boar, monkey, lynx, and mammoth. A large number of these remains show evidence of butchery, 
particularly deer. These deer appear to have been carried back whole to the site. Other larger animals were only brought in pieces such as limbs or skulls. Our evidence indicates that prey was being brought back to the entire family group to share. This suggests cooperation and perhaps a division of flavor. 95% of the animal remains show no carnivore damage. This is highly indicative of direct hunting rather than a reliance on scavenging. Two fossils even show tooth marks on top of cut marks, suggesting carnivores only got to the remains after a group of antecessor were already done with it. At the older Cima del Elefante site, herbivore remains such as deer, elephant, rats, rabbits, boar, bison, beaver, and tortoise have been found. Though so have carnivores. Canids, bear, fox, a big cat, and lynx have been found. Some bones of large herbivores from the site were cracked open to get access to the marrow, and other bones have cut marks. This brings up interesting questions about this species. How did they obtain these animals? Some animals would have certainly been merely scavenged, but it does appear that they had direct access to many animals before any other animals got a hold of them. It is likely they used wooden spears and perhaps stones as weapons. Their stone tools certainly could have shaped simple or even more refined spears. Wooden spears can even simply be made by breaking a stick into a jagged edge. A plain old stone could have also functioned as an ambush weapon for throwing or even just bashing. Their shoulders and overall morphology would have certainly allowed them to powerfully throw. Considering the amount of prey animals we find at their site, it is clear that they were quite deadly hunters. They even appear to have hunted each other. An abundance of their remains, which were smashed and cut with stone tools, has made us rethink what we thought about this species and this time in human evolution. But before we understand their man-eating tendencies, we must understand the bigger picture of the finds at Atapuerca. Atapuerca is a small hill located on a natural corridor connecting the basins of two different rivers. The area surrounding the hill was very ecologically rich, providing grazing grounds for large herbivores, lush forests for medium game, and two rivers to drink from. The Atapuerca Hill itself was a perfect place for hominins to make their base camp, which they could hunt in the surrounding basin, then bring their game to safety on the slopes of Atapuerca. Atapuerca has more than just antecessor remains. Remains of other hominins such as Heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and many modern human populations are found in younger layers. All of these hominins understood the hill's importance for procuring and protecting their prey. This is important to keep in mind when we discuss the anthropophagy found at this site. Because this production is meant for YouTube, I will refrain from using this word and instead use the word anthropophagy. 80 specimens from young adults and children from Grandolina exhibit evidence of anthropophagy. Antecessor themselves are the second most commonly butchered prey at Grandolina. It wasn't just a few cuts being made either, their corpses were extensively processed. Most of our cranial evidence of this species shows evidence that they were smashed. They were percussed with such force that the teeth show impact scars at the gum line. Furthermore, muscle attachments at the base of the skull and face were deeply cut. The cranial evidence suggests that these hominins were getting access to the nutritious brains of their slain contemporaries. The postcranial remains are no less extensive. Ribs bear cut marks along their length, back muscles were cut off, the meat around the clavicles were sawed off, and the vertebrae were shattered. Femurs were smashed to extract the marrow, and even hands and feet show cut marks and percussion damage. The evidence seems to suggest that the unfortunate victims were being consumed for nutritional purposes, but there is more to the story. When comparing the processing of human skulls as compared to how they process animal skulls, we see a striking difference. Human cranial elements, even the face, display significantly more cut marks in the face of any prey species. When this has occurred in populations of modern humans, it is strongly associated with exoanthropophagy. Exoanthropophagy is a form of anthropophagy where the victim is from someone beyond their social group, typically from a nearby group of competitors or enemies. This is often explained as sending a message to the enemy group. Murdering one of their own and eating them is universally an act of intimidation, aggression, and disrespect. Chimpanzees have been seen exhibiting the exact same behavior. They often share borders with other violent groups. In one documented case, a young chimp was killed by a hostile neighboring group. 
The attackers which made the kill brought the body into the trees and consumed part of the corpse. This behavior is not entirely understood, but it seems to not only serve to weaken the neighboring tribe in numbers, but also in morale. The desecration of the corpse may serve as nutritional as well as to spread fear among their competitors. When looking back at our evidence of this behavior in Homo antecessor, we are left with many questions. There are a few main possibilities. The evidence may support violent exoanthropophagy, starvation-induced nutritional anthropophagy, or just endoanthropophagy. The first possibility takes into account the context of the site. Atapuerca has been a bountiful base camp for well over a million years. It is possible this prized territory was fought over to get control of the defensible high ground from which control over the surrounding area could be established. The abundance of young individuals that were consumed may support the idea that they were specifically targeted and consumed in a similar way to the behavior we have observed in chimpanzees and ancient modern human cultures. The heavily processed facial remains are also quite characteristic of violent exoanthropophagy. However, it is possible that the people of Atapuerca simply ate members of rival groups or their own due to starvation. The abundance of cut marks in the face of the butchered remains could also be evidence of inexperienced butchers. Humans have a much different morphology than the typical prey animals of these groups. It is possible that the cut marks simply represent a lack of experience butchering humans. A 2019 study explained the youthful demographic of these victims as the expected average demographic of hunter-gatherer groups with a high mortality rate. Meaning the average antecessor was a young adult or child since their world was so deadly. It is hard to rule out the possibility that these people were just starving. Though plenty of game, large and small, is found in their layers and the antecessor individuals do not appear to have been starving. The last option would be endoanthropophagy. Endoanthropophagy, consuming individuals from within a group, is common throughout human species. When looking to chimpanzees once again, documented cases have been seen of adult individuals, male and female, killing infants and then partially eating them. The reason for this is also not entirely understood. Though it may be to eliminate competition or for some other reason beyond our understanding, chimps are not humans, and we are obviously much closer to antecessor. The fact that antecessor were human, as in hominin, the possibility exists that these individuals were being consumed for an abstract reason. Anthropophagy has been practiced in our species probably for as long as we have existed, and certainly in more recent times. Some tribes in Papua New Guinea believed that consuming the flesh of their dead loved one was the respectful way to honor them. Why let the foul maggots consume your loved ones when your tribe could benefit from all that nutrition? The possibility exists that antecessor consumed their kin for a reason that was not malevolent. They very well may have eaten family members that met a natural end. It could have also been a way to dispose of the dead. Though these possibilities may sound repulsive to us, we must understand that we are talking about hominins from a million years ago. Their culture and social behaviors are alien to our own. The reality that something we find so absolutely repulsive can be something entirely respectful in other cultures is the reason I find anthropophagy to be one of the most interesting anthropological topics. It puts our own beliefs into perspective and expands the possibilities of what it means to be human. In the case of Homo antecessor, we have very tantalizing evidence, though we cannot come to a definite conclusion at this moment. Another point that needs to be made about this evidence of anthropophagy is that it may not be representative of their entire species. Atapuerca is one hill in northern Spain. Butchered remains do span different layers and therefore thousands of years, but just because anthropophagy may have been common here, doesn't mean it was elsewhere in Spain or even as far as the British Isles. The last form of evidence we have regarding this species is their pathology. Pathology is the study of the causes and effects of disease or injury. It has proven to be a very important form of evidence to understand nuances related to culture and social relationships. It is also terrifying to think of how these hominins had to endure painful injuries and diseases with little to no treatments. The face of ATD-69 has an upper third molar that erupted improperly. This caused an impaction of the second molar which blocked it from erupting. This could have led to lesions, cavities, and painful cysts. The mandible of ATE9-1 has severely worn tooth crowns that expose the root canals. One can only imagine how painful it must have been for this individual to eat anything remotely tough. It appears this occurred from gum disease which itself may have occurred from carrying around items with the teeth. 
The left knee bone of ATD6-56 has a lesion on the knee which may have come from improper loading and intense activity. The fourth metatarsal of ATD6-124 has a lesion consistent with a March fracture. March fractures are typically due to repeated high-intensity activity. It is a condition that often affects long-distance runners, soldiers, and flat-footed people. The feet of antecessor may have not been adapted to their terrain as the later Neanderthals would develop much more robust feet and lower halves to endure the difficult terrain of much of Europe. Our remains do not preserve evidence of any serious injuries nor apparent carnivore attacks. Carnivores are almost certainly a big concern for a species lacking fire or truly complex tools and weaponry. In the fossil record, we have seen that hominins in a similar stage of development as antecessor were quite vulnerable to predators. Check out my video titled, When We Met Monsters, to learn more. As far as the culture or social structure of this species, we are left with many questions. It is difficult to answer many of these questions for Neanderthals or even ancient modern humans, let alone a species mainly found on one hill. Our evidence may suggest these groups were involved in violent competition with neighboring groups. Let's imagine what a day would have been like in the life of a young antecessor living along the Ebro River over one million years ago. The onset of a glacial period far in the depths of time has caused the climate of the Iberian Peninsula to gradually become much colder. For a group of eight antecessor located in a valley along the Ebro River, this has meant frigid winters, cool summers, and increased competition with neighboring groups. For an already mature 14-year-old antecessor, this has meant the violent demise of his younger brother along with two close companions. A stronger group of 15 one valley over had taken his kin by force in a midnight raid. Now his mother, sister, and five others live in a quiet fear. They move carefully through their small plot of earth on the lookout for any others. At night, they sleep under thick brush, and during the day, they move throughout hidden trails which help them navigate the valley. Food has been scarce. Two weeks ago, a medium-sized deer was ambushed with spear and taken. The organs were quickly eaten while much of the meat was dried in open air. Many of the bones were left uncracked for later use. Only a few of these bones remain along with some of the raw hide. For our young antecessor, he is left chewing on partially dried, rotting hide. The rest of the bone marrow will go to the youngest children, of which there are three. An aggressive male loosely related to him also hoards his share. He is the only fully mature male in the group, along with another mature female and his mature sister, age 16. Along with our protagonist, these three other individuals are the only ones capable of defending against an attack. On this cold autumn morning, our group awakes huddled together for warmth under some dense foliage. They awake long before first light due to their incessant hunger. Without communication, they understand their duties and quickly set off for a laborious day. Our protagonist, though only 14 years old, is already nearing physical maturity. He is still weaker than the aggressive 20-year-old male who occasionally beats him down, but he is old enough to hold his own in a fight or against aggressive prey. He sets off with the older male and one of the older females. They each carry a crudely made spear with them while our protagonist is also stuck carrying two additional backup spears along with a handful of sharp flint flakes. They quietly follow along their memorized path to a choke point between the neighboring valley. This valley is not home to the stronger group of fifteen, but rather a weaker group of seven. Due to careful surveillance, they know that this group is quite poor at hunting. They have seen deer with insufficient wounds of the gut and hindquarters. These wounds only serve to weaken the deer, which often seek refuge high on the hill separating these two valleys. On occasion, our group has even seen members of this group hopelessly chase the wounded animals. They are mainly young individuals who lack the maturity of figure or of experience to be able to efficiently take game. Not only does this allow our group to find these weakened animals, the possibility exists to hunt the other hunters. Understanding this, our party of three formidable aggressors sets up their post for the day at this choke point. Long hours go by. Various animals are seen, but none huntable. A herd of rhinos can be seen grazing near the river below, though without eight or more hunters, it is an impossible challenge to make one of these beasts breathless. 
Deer are seen in the distance, but in open plains. Approaching a deer requires extreme stealth. The hunters opt to spend hours in concealed cover than to waste calories chasing tails. At around midday, some deer run near their positions from the neighboring valley. A dozen or so take an alternate path far out of reach. Moments later, another comes limping down the trail. It is still quite fast, and far too fast for the hunters to run over to the other path. But just as predicted, the sounds of soft human footsteps crunching leaves approaches. A lone hunter, lean and full of stamina, continues the chase. He is far off from the deer, but may eventually catch up with it as its wound continues to flow. The party is not frightened nor hasty. They know this trail leads towards their home and that the trail runs along a short cliff. They silently leave their positions and march off trail to eventually try to cut the man off. However, on their way to the ambush point, they hear the unmistakable groans of death. Their neighboring hunter has made a successful kill. Our party quickly sprints through the remaining woods out for blood. Stealth is no longer of primary concern. They must get to the carcass before he drags it away or his companions join him. After a winded sprint, they come upon him devouring the organs. His gluttony would be his downfall as our party sets up on the top of the cliff edge. While crouched over, chewing on liver, a spear is thrown into his thigh, his back, and one wings his shoulder. The man is immediately immobilized before the twenty-year-old male charges him with one final thrust. He lie dead alongside his quarry. For a moment in the lands of Iberia one million years ago, all seems well. The hunt worked out almost perfectly. The three now have enough meat to feed their kin, strengthen their children, and hunt another day. The oldest male grabs the fallen quarry and slings him over his shoulder. Our protagonist and the older female both grab some legs and set off towards home with the deer. The oldest male gets some distance ahead of them. He is stronger and it is easier to carry the man than the limp deer. As the march continues, they begin to see blood on the trail. At first, they don't think much of it. They think that maybe the old vet decided to have a bite of some flesh prematurely or maybe the fallen foe was still bleeding. Whatever the case, they carry on. Consistently, they see a stream of blood until they come around a bend. Here, they interrupt a party of eight adults feeding on their old friend in his quarry. The aggressors immediately notice them, and a chase ensues. The deer is dropped, and the two run as fast as they can. They keep the distance, but not by much. Soon, a thud is heard, and the woman is no longer besides our protagonist. He looks back to see several thrusts, followed by some twitching. He continues to run, pursued by three. A whirling wind is heard alongside a sharp pain. His left arm dangles limp. But he continues to run, and a while later he looks back to find no one. Stopping to finally rest, he realizes blood is dripping from his back and his arm no longer functions. He is wounded, but his mind only thinks about what is next. Two of the adults from his group are dead. Now, only his mother, his older sister, two children, and one toddler remain. Their odds of survival are slim to none. Winter will soon come along with a certain death. As he returns to his family, he finds them well, but he is empty-handed and one-armed. His old mother and sister are the only ones capable of hunting while he is near useless. Their only hope may be to join the equally weak neighboring tribe which has just lost their last adult male. As the sun finally clears the horizon, our protagonist watches the children chew on sinew and lick shards of bone. Their future is uncertain, and their survival is unlikely. This story is of course fiction, though it is written with reality in mind. Considering our evidence, it is entirely possible situations similar to this played out in the world of Homo Antecessor. Life was undoubtedly hard, and conflict undoubtedly occurred. Groups such as the one mentioned were at the mercy of stronger and more numerous foes. In the writing of this story, I actually took a bit of inspiration from the story of Ishii, the last Native American to live in the wild. He and his family lived for many years in isolation, camping secretly and frequenting only hidden trails. Some of the behavior I have described in this story may have been too complex for the minds of Antecessor, though I don't personally believe these behaviors are out of their capabilities. 
Predators such as tigers are known to maneuver with extreme cunning and are even thought to be vengeful. Complex stories such as this one likely did indeed play out in the valleys of Iberia over one million years ago. The oldest Homo antecessor remains are dated to 1.4 million years ago and sparsely persist in the fossil record until around 770,000 years ago. This does not mean that this species went extinct during or shortly after this time. Considering the footprints in England may have been made by individuals of the same species, we really cannot say for certain when this species vanished. What we do know is that they did vanish. Not only did their morphology disappear, but DNA evidence suggests that they did not contribute to future European populations. The hominins to move into this region were likely descendants of Erectus, perhaps migrating from the Middle East or even all the way from Africa. They would expand across the continent and be known as Homo heidelbergensis. These populations would seemingly find much more success than antecessor ever achieved. Though let's not take this away from our long-lost cousins, more like long-lost great-aunts and uncles. They were the first hominins to expand into the incredibly hostile territory of Europe. The geography and climate of Europe are very challenging to live in for hominins that evolved under the beating sun of Africa. The fact that these hominins were able to migrate into at least Iberia and survive for over half a million years is really mind-boggling when you think about it. They withstood winter after winter, predators big and small, and even hostile groups of themselves. Though they may seem like a footnote in prehistory, they survived in this breathtaking environment for longer than our species has even existed. Instead of looking at them as evolutionary failures, we should look at them as the brave souls that came before. Their countless stories may be lost forever, but our imaginations, which themselves are a product of the evolutionary process, can allow us to appreciate the greatest story ever told. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I am so glad I can make another addition to the Ancient Human series which I have neglected for so long. This species was a lot more interesting than I initially thought, and I have a feeling that we have a lot more to discover about their mysteries. There will be future episodes of the Ancient Human series, but I am running out of species with enough information to make meaningful productions on, so we'll have to see about that. Anyways, I want to hear your thoughts about my little short story woven into here. It was experimental indeed, but I hope it added a good touch and excited the imagination. It was truly a pleasure to make this video, and I hope you will watch the many more I have planned. Also, check out the new channel I made. I am quite passionate about recreating ancient technologies as they allow for so much insight about the way our ancestors lived. Flint napping was once a practice essential to our survival, and even was until relatively recently. Some populations even still rely on it. I plan to make so many things on this channel and I know you will all love it. I want to thank you all again. This has been your host Northo2 and I'll see you on the next one. Ciao.